Well, hello everyone and welcome to our HPO Conversations, where we're talking about a very exciting concert on Sunday, May 1st at the First Ontario Concert Hall. It's at 7.30pm. We really hope you can make it and it's called Postcards from Buenos Aires. And we have our concert master and soloist for this program, Stephen Satarsky, with us for these conversations today. Steve, thanks for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure, Gemma. Well, we can't wait to hear this wonderful concerto. And I wanted to start off by saying how lucky we are to have you both as our concert master and to also enjoy your solo talents. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your career path as a violinist and how did you start off on the violin and what brought you all the way here to Hamilton? Oh my goodness, where do I start? Uh, so I, I'm probably pretty typical of uh, most professional string players. I started at quite an early age. I'm told I began uh, studying the violin something before the age of five, so four and a half years old, which is not atypical for most uh, string players because it's, it's such a, a, um, a challenging instrument to learn and there are so many neural pathways and little muscles and whatever that need to develop as um, as the person is actually growing, uh, you know, in in into an adult. Um, it's very difficult for uh, adult people to learn a stringed instrument from scratch because they they lack, you know, it, all of these muscles and, and everything have already developed and they haven't developed in the mode of already playing the instrument. And so for me, um, I, I was fortunate enough to begin early enough to take advantage of that developmental, um, physical and mental phase uh, in, in my growing up. Um, and well, like most young people, uh, if you have a little bit of talent and you spend a little bit of time working and you have at least a, a fairly competent uh, teacher or teachers, um, then you just sort of go from one thing to another. Uh, most places that offer uh, music lessons also have opportunities for young players to perform in what they call festivals, in which case there are uh, there are imposed pieces to play or a certain level that everyone performs at. And, and then sometimes they, they award prizes for you know, the best performance. But um, so little by little, after having some success in some of these uh, in some of these events, um, it just kept going from there and kept learning new things and improving as a player and getting better teachers and uh, uh, without boring everyone uh, with with every event that I participated in. That's kind of how it starts. And then um, usually you don't specialize in um, the music profession until sort of post high school, post secondary school, college level, university level. And that's when I made the decision to go into music as a profession and study it at, at uh, the highest level that I could. Um, and then at that point, um, you, you graduate from uh, the college or the university or the academy or the conservatory or whichever high level of uh, institution that you're studying at. And uh, usually you start getting uh, offers to perform and people are willing to actually pay you for them. And that's kind of pretty exciting for a young musician um, having performed most of the time for nothing uh, or even having to pay you know, for the opportunities to perform. Uh, and then you start earning a little bit of money. And if you're good at playing in ensembles, uh, you typically will be, you know, contractors will hear, will hear about oh there's this young talented player and and he or she is pretty good at you know fitting into the ensemble and playing and and so that's how it worked for me I, I started getting offers to perform with um at the at first kind of freelance orchestras for choir performances in churches and, and things like that and then little by little started getting hired by you know more established professional groups as an extra player and then typically, um, if, you, if you like playing in orchestra and ensembles, uh, then you start looking for um, opportunities to get 
a more permanent job. So that there's a little bit more job security and a little bit more security in terms of knowing where where your your rent money and your food money and, and whatever is coming from. And so that was no different for me. You know, then you have to prepare to audition for an open position in um, an orchestra or an ensemble. And, and that's a whole other discussion for another day. Perhaps we can talk about that because it's a very, very complex um, process, as you know well. Um, and so over the years, I've, you know, sort of jumped from um, one orchestra to another, depending on my, my life situation and career. And, and so now I'm just um, over the moon, delighted to be concert master in, in Hamilton, which I think fits um, my career right now very well. And I really enjoy it. And um, I love my colleagues and I love working with you and I love our audience. And, and I just think we've got a, a really amazing thing going on in Hamilton right now, which is continuing to grow. So we're very fortunate to have you as our concert master and our soloist coming up. And we're also have been so pleased to have you conduct in the fall our orchestra, as well as um, we wanted to share a bit of a sneak peek into the chamber music that you are involved with with the HPO. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so the the the, the chamber music, it's, it's always kind of been part of the HPO's um, uh, sort of stable of uh, of performance offerings, um, but I think we're we're going in a direction now where it's a little more f formally organized, and we're actually going to plan some some series in some um, identified venues. Um, we have always done chamber music for uh, sort of outreach type events and education and school concerts and things like that. Um, but there's so much great, great, great music for smaller ensembles. And because the HPO doesn't perform as a full orchestra every single week of the year, um, there's a lot of time in between our main stage full orchestra concerts for other, um, uh, other uh, events like that. And what's great about, um, about the idea of chamber music is that we can take it almost anywhere, you know, we can play in, in restaurants and in bars in churches and community centers, schools, even private homes if, if the, the, the right opportunity comes up. Um, so there's all sorts of different things we can do. And then of course, there's every possible style of music in, involved in the smaller ensembles from beautiful early Baroque music all the way to music that was literally written you know, yesterday um, that, that will speak to everyone um, with the perspective of, of, of today's world. Um, so we're kind of excited to maybe formalize a lot of these ideas a little bit more and, and really present them um, to the people of Hamilton. Yes, definitely. I'm so excited. I really loved how our musicians stepped up uh, during the pandemic for more chamber music uh, yeah. than we have used to do. And uh, it is really something quite special because our players are so superb and we see them in a very intimate setting, something quite personal and close up. So we look forward to more of that and more information very soon about that. Um, but we have this concert on May 1st and it highlights the Piazzolla Four Seasons Concerto. I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your journey with the piece in preparation for uh, this concert and maybe what we might be listening for. Yeah, so, so May the 1st, uh, let's cross all of our fingers because I think it's the, the fourth date that we have scheduled this concert for, or at least the third anyway. Um, so the Piazzolla, um, for, for those people who maybe don't know who Piazzolla is. Uh, he was a uh, an accordion player. Well, they don't call it an accordion in Argentina, but a bandoneon, uh, which is a little bit like a, an accordion with buttons. Um, and he actually he studied music uh, quite um, at quite a serious level, a classical level. Study with some very famous teachers and sort of learned the craft. But what he's best known for is kind of being the father of the modern tango musical style in Argentina. So most people know the, you know, bum, 
bum 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 that kind of tango feel and um and certainly there's a lot of music that uses that almost you know identical type of rhythm and feel um but he kind of took the idea of tango and really expanded it into a, almost a whole other stylistic world and occasionally you will hear the same kind of rhythmic elements that a, a, a traditional tango has but he really just takes it and, and explodes into all sorts of different areas and he had a um, a group that he used to perform and record with. Um, I think there were seven players in total. I'd, I'd have to check depending on, on the situation. Um, but one of the players that he had was a violinist. Um, I forget the man's name at the moment, but um, unbelievably expressive violinist in his ensemble um, in terms of um, the sound that he makes and uh, the way he would phrase things um, and was a very, very important part of that ensemble. And you would hear the violin play lots of solos. And so uh, Piazzolo would, would write music featuring this violinist quite often. And everyone, of course, knows the Vivaldi Four Seasons, which is, you know, it's so ubiquitous and, and so well known, whatever, but it's, it's actually a really clever, clever piece. Like it's not just fun to listen to, but the whole concept you know, behind the piece is really cool because Vivaldi basically takes each of the four weather, you know, seasons from the calendar and kind of creates these little vignettes um, that represent sort of the weather and types of activities that people would do within the seasons, those four seasons. And so Piazzolo obviously uh, took the idea from Vivaldi and composed his own set a four season, then he called them the four seasons of Buenos Aires. Um, but it's interesting because, because as you know, in the Southern hemisphere, and you're from the Southern hemisphere, the seasons are all different <laughs> from, uh, from the, the South. Um, so his are, are kind of in a different order than Bobaldi's, um, but basically have the same kind of idea. Um, although they aren't in sort of, formal movements like Vivaldi, they're, they're just sort of through composed and, and uh, um, are very organic going from one section to another. There are four distinct pieces for sure that, that there are like, there's a stop in between each piece. Um, but once you start the individual pieces that you just kind of, they just roll along as they go. Uh, Does it use quotes from the Vivaldi Four Seasons? There are definitely, um, I don't want to give it away, I'll let the audience try to pick them out. Some of them are pretty easy to hear, and then some of them are sort of buried in the texture uh, here and there that you can kind of make out if you're listening for them. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Are there any um, special sound effects or what we call extended techniques uh, that we might hear from the string section? Or is that... Yeah, the, well, there's one in particular and, and Piazzolo was, um, was quite uh, famous for, for using this sort of, so there's a percussion instrument called the guero, I think it is. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it perfectly, but it's sort of this, I, I think it's a stick that you rub on wood that's, that's had these little um, notches etched in them so you get this kind of kind of sound, like a, almost like a ratchet sort of sound, um, and you can actually use the percussive percussive um, instrument to, to get that sound. But also, you can kind of fudge it with a string instrument. And sometimes we turn the bow upside down and use the the there's sort of a little winding sort of right around where we hold the bow. And sometimes that can produce that, that kind of effect. Sometimes we just do a really fast, aggressive sort of tremolo effect with the bow um, behind the bridge sometimes. And that gets that sort of really aggressive kind of percussive sound. Um, I think there are also a couple of places in, the, in this piece that players are asked to use the wood of the bow sort of as a percussive effect. Um, so yeah, there's, there's some um, sort of funky sounds that, 
that are are going to be heard in this piece for sure. And the dance rhythms are going to get us all having our toes tapping and maybe dancing in the aisles. Um, for sure, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I assume it, it has that folk element uh, or it's been inspired by the music of Argentina as, as you talked about the tango. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add about these influences? Um, not really. I mean, the, 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 even though the piece was composed probably, oh, the original piece probably was composed maybe a few decades ago, uh, this arrangement is maybe only 15, 20 years old. It was done for a very famous uh, violinist, Gidon Kramer, and it was a friend of his, Leonid Desyatnikov is, is his friend's name, who arranged the Piazzolla ensemble piece for solo violin and a string group as, as we'll be playing. And really, you, there's not a whole lot you need to t talk about. It's just, it's full of infectious rhythms. It's full of beautiful melodies. It's full of, uh, as you mentioned, some Vivaldi quotes, just to sort of tie it into to the idea of the Vivaldi. Um, I think, I think, and this is what we're, I think, going to work hard on in rehearsal and hopefully achieve it in performance, is just to um, extend all of the effects and the energy of the piece to as big a contrast as we can, because it just, it, you can't over, almost can't overplay this music. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like there's some pieces, for example, you know, beautiful, elegant Mozart, whatever, if you play it too aggressively and, and bring out too many contrasts, it just, it, it, um, it makes the music sound kind of ugly and, and um, twisted, you know, it just doesn't work. Whereas for this piece, I think we're all encouraged to just go for it all the time. It can never be too intense, too passionate, too, um, singing to you know ugly in parts like seriously like there are some places that the music really demands that that players aren't too polite when they perform and i really hope that we can get that um that feeling throughout so that the audience is just sort of sitting on the edge of their seats not quite knowing what's coming next and what kind of effect will will really um send them you know into whichever emotional place uh, that it can. So I think that's that's what I'm looking forward to. Definitely. I love that approach. And that intense drama and passion is also found in the Variaciones Constantes, which is the last piece on our program. Uh, really wanted us to have that as a neighboring work because it highlights um, many different sections of our orchestra. And it's always wonderful to have a spotlight on our wonderful players uh, with the variations in front. It's very dramatic work, lots of darkness and light and great contrast, mm -hmm. as Steve mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then we also have two other pieces on the program that have uh, similar themes and threads. So Ari Verhul van der Ven is our composer fellow who has written a brand new piece that we'll be hearing for the very first time in the world in this concert on May 1st. And he was inspired by the Hamilton Niagara escarpment. Um, so, you know, our land uh, around us in Hamilton. And he was looking at the way the rock was formed, so striking in its appearance. Mm. And the history of the land, um, the idea that if you sped history up, uh, you would see it move like a river. And so you hear many currents, different speeds and um, different textures floating around in this very dynamic work. And uh, we also have a very emotional work um, to begin our program, Elegia Andina by Gabriela Elena Frank. Um, it's a very personal work to her, um, dedicated to her older brother, as she grew up in a multicultural family with her father being Lithuanian Jewish and her mother being Chinese Peruvian Spanish. Wow. And uh, so she found that this multicultural heritage um, was something that she really thrived in. Uh, she was able to um, 
incorporate Peruvian folk songs and the rags of Scott Joplin and then J.S. Bach into her compositions. And this is an early composition that has um, the influences of the Peruvian panpipe, which represents her questions about her multicultural heritage. So very cool. uh, it's yeah. a very exciting, dynamic, um, colorful program. I think uh, I love all of the dance rhythms and, and the textures we'll get from Ari's piece and the emotion from Gabriella's piece and, and then the lightness and darkness from the variaciones. So um, I really hope everyone loves this program. And uh, once again, we want to thank Steve so much for being with us today. And also we say toy 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 for the concert on May 1st. Thanks, Gemma.